welcome to St. Paul Lutheran. It's a pleasure to be around God's Word with you today. Uh, a special welcome to any, any guests or visitors you have with us. Anybody watching online, leave a like, leave a comment, let the others, uh, the other brothers and sisters know that you're you're watching with them. Glad to have you with us. Our focus today is one of the famous Jesus uh, I am statements. He says, I am the vine and we are the branches. So that'll be our focus today and how Jesus produces much good fruit in all of us. God bless our worship and we begin with our first hymn. Such a 
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world our hearts may ever yearn to the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading appointed for use in Christian churches this Sunday comes from Acts chapter 4. Normally the, the first reading comes from the Old Testament, but in the season of Easter they come from the book of Acts to show how the, the good news of Jesus' resurrection of the dead is, is a defeat of sin, how that spread through the world. From Acts chapter 4. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 63. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you, in a dry and parched land, where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary, and beheld your power and glory, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. All who swear by God will glory in him while the mouths of liars will be silenced. The second reading comes from 1 John chapter 3. Being branches of the true vine of Jesus as we are, we bear the fruit of faith. And the, the chief fruit is, is love, and John tells us about that love today, that it is more than just words. Action. Dear children, 
Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand to honor the words and the works of Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Hallelujah. Today's gospel reading is from John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated.
this week, Jesus wants us to think like branches. He says he is the true vine. Jesus says he is the true vine, and his Father is the gardener, and we are the branches. So I'm inviting you today to do this little thought experiment with me. Think like a branch. Pastor, branches don't have brains. They can't think. I think that's exactly the point Jesus is trying to make here, or at least part of his point. It's easy to think like a branch because they don't think. They just do. They just do what is natural for a branch to do. They remain in the vine, receive life-giving nutrients from the vine, so they bear fruit. As we imagine ourselves as branches today, as a part of Jesus' vine, we'll learn how we depend on Jesus for a fruitful life. Do what's natural for a branch to do. Remain in the vine. Depend on the vine for life. Bear much fruit. The time that Jesus spoke these words was the, the night before his death. He was either in the upper room when he was enjoying the Last Supper with his disciples or was on the way from that upper room to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And he took this last opportunity that he had with them before he was arrested and executed to teach them some very important things. John recorded what Jesus said here in the, in the 15th chapter of his gospel. We begin at verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. So Jesus is the vine. God the Father is the gardener, and he hasn't said it yet, but it's implied. We, his disciples, are the branches. And the Father gardener cuts off the unproductive branches, and he prunes the fruitful ones. When I first started studying this, this section of scripture last week, I, I, to be honest with you, I, I was a little troubled and confused about this last verse, verse, verse 2 here. It, it didn't make sense to me how there could be branches in Jesus that had no fruit. I mean, Jesus is the, the creator of the world. He is the all-powerful word of God that gives everything life. So how could there be anybody attached to him who doesn't show and bear the fruit of the life that he gives? To not bear fruit. What a weird, what an unnatural thing for a branch to do. I mean, it's the whole purpose of a branch is to bear fruit. And the consequence for not doing it is heavy. The branch is cut off by the gardener. The more I thought about this, I, I think Jesus wants us to be a little troubled and upset about what he says here, because this is a serious warning from us. His point is, it would be unnatural for us who have faith in him to not bear the fruits of faith. And the most important fruit or result of our faith in Jesus is love. That's what the, the Ten Commandments are summed up by loving God and loving others. So it, it would be unnatural, unthinkable, to have faith in Jesus' unconditional love for us and to not obey his most basic command, love people. But no matter how unnatural that would be, if that were to happen, we would be cut off from Jesus. We must remain in him. Later on in, in verse 6, Jesus says that if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, 
and burn. Whenever Jesus talks like this, he's, he's talking about hell. Brothers and sisters, don't, don't do the unthinkable. Do what is natural for a branch to do. Remain in the vine. Remain in Jesus. Stay with him. And what that means is believe in him, trust him, and depend on him for life. If we're worried about not seeing a whole lot of good fruit in our lives, if we're worried about sins that constantly seem to suck the joy out of life and threaten our connection to God, or to use another analogy Jesus gives, if we're worried about being dirty and guilty with sin, then listen to what Jesus says next. He says, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. This is such a wonderful, life-giving verse of Scripture here. Think about this. We are already clean. Already? Yes, already. Jesus' words recorded for us in, in Genesis chapter 1, where he created this universe with his word and gave it life. It's like the, the word that he spoke to his disciples in the upper room that night that made them clean. And, it's, and the word Jesus spoke while dying on the cross has already made us clean. With his last dying breaths on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. It is, it is finished. Everything needed to save us from sin is finished. When he said that, that was, that was his absolution for the world and for all people of all time. It is finished. Everything needed to cleanse us of sin, everything needed to, to make the dead wood of our hearts into living branches is finished. Already before we knew it or heard it or believed it, before we were even born, Jesus thought of us and spoke words to make us clean. I made this verse into a little Christian mantra this past week just because it's so comforting. It's so comforting when, when I feel dead and dirty inside. <clears throat> it goes like this. I am already clean because the word Jesus has spoken to you. Say that with me. It's okay, you can say it out loud or with me in your head if you're comfortable. I am already clean because of the word Jesus has spoken to you. One more time. Let's say let's see it if we can get this. I am already clean because of the word Jesus has spoken to me. That's the truth. That's the truth. And there are so many other words of Jesus like that in Scripture that we cling to for life, for productivity, to be connected with God. You know, it's, a, it's natural for us to, to meditate on and to, to hear the repeated words of Jesus because they're what we depend on for life. Just like a branch depends on life-giving sap from the vine. Being around Jesus' words constantly so we are reminded of them and we can trust in them, that's what it means to remain in Jesus. You know, Jesus says the word remain eight times in this short section of Scripture, and he starts saying it in verse 4. He says, remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So when we remain in Jesus, he, he also remains in us. And what he does in us is produce the fruit and the good works that are pleasing to God in our lives. That's the, the second natural thing for a branch to do 
is bear fruit. Jesus really wants to drive this point home because he says it again in just a little bit different way in verse 5. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus makes it really simple. Right? It's, it's natural for branches to bear fruit just so long as they remain in the vine. And obviously, if, if a branch stops depending on the vine, or somehow is able to, to separate itself from the vine, it's not going to be fruitful. It's going to die. And so it's natural for us as disciples of Jesus to bear fruits of faith. As long as we remain in him, he says, we will, we will bear much fruit. That's an amazing thing Jesus said there. He doesn't say, if you remain in me, you should bear much fruit, or that you might bear much fruit. He says, if you remain in me, you will. You will bear much fruit. So we will thank God for the life and the love that he gives us, and that full of that love, we will love others. And we will do whatever else is good according to God's word. Remember, again, without being attached to Jesus, we can do nothing. If we want to be fruitful and productive, living lives of service to God and to others, then we must remain in Jesus and his word. You know, this reminds me of, of something that almost all uh, Lutherans and many other Christians say at once in their lifetime, when uh, new members are received into this church or into our other, our other sister churches all over the world, the pastor asks them, and you'll, you'll be reminded of this, because we had some new members who, who uh, joined our fellowship just this last month. But uh, I ask, do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith? Be diligent in the use of God's word and sacraments? and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do. And I ask God to help me. That is us answering Jesus' call, promising to remain in him. And there is no greater promise a human being could make on this earth. But it's not a special promise. It's actually quite normal, but it's natural. For branches of the true vine to want to and to promise to be around God's life-giving word often. Right? It would be totally unnatural, unthinkable, really, to, to separate ourselves from the source of life. It would be as unnatural as, as choosing to die. If our busy lives, if our complicated lives ever get the better of us, and we come to our senses and we realize that we have been separated from Jesus' word for weeks, months, or even years, then we need to remember what Jesus says here. We are branches of his vine. We are branches. How far, how patient Will the Father Gardener be with us? How long can a branch live without getting its nutrients from the vine? A couple days? A week? Maybe. How long? How can it bear fruit if it's not in the vine? And how long before it has no fruit at all and is cut off and thrown away? Jesus doesn't tell us the answers to those questions. And we wouldn't want to try and find out the answers ourselves. Whatever we do, we remember who we are. Disciples of the Son of God. Branches in the only true life-giving vine. So when we, when we make our monthly schedules and we think about our daily habits and our plans for the future, we do so with 
our identity as branches at the forefront of our lives and Jesus as the priority because he is the source of life. We depend on him for cleansing and strength, comfort, forgiveness, renewal, and rest, everything we need. Access to Jesus is access to his words and then to his, his body, which is the church. The church is what generally, most of the time, is teaching and, and preaching his word. To the church, the sacraments, which also contain the life-giving gospel, are administered. So when we, you know, we choose what, what job we want to do in life, when we, when we think about where we want to move to or retire, we make sure that there is a, a good church nearby that we can be served with Jesus' word. Or at least there, this is a way we can remain in God's word and somebody can come and and serve us the sacrament. And so also when we and when we think about our, our children, when our children are thinking about where to go to college or where to go away to school and what jobs they want to work, part of the discussion that we have with them is you know, how, how are they going to remain in Jesus while they are away from home? Is there a, is there a good church? nearby the college they want to go to? Is there a way for them to get to that church? Because not a lot of them have a car at that point. Is there a caring and solid Christian community that will encourage them as the word, and as the false ideas and lies in so many of the universities influence them? At the end of, of this section of scripture, Jesus says, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So to remain in Jesus, depending on him for life and fruit, that is our purpose in life. This is what glorifies God. And if we ever find ourselves doubting our identity as, as disciples, as Christians. If we worry about the lack of fruit in our lives, and the solution is not to, to try really, really hard and focus all of our attention on trying to bear more fruit. No. Remember, we are, we are branches. Branches don't think. They, they don't focus all their attention to grow more grapes. They just do. It's what's natural for branches to do. So if we're worried about anything like that, then we remain in Jesus, and we trust him. We trust him when he says that if we remain in him, then he remains in us, and we will bear much fruit. This is to the Father's glory. Amen. Please stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now's normally the time we pass around the offering basket, but for now, we'll, we'll keep it in the lobby. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you have grafted us onto the vine of your Son. 
prune us, and cut off from us all sin and dead works, that we may always draw life from your Son, and produce the fruits of faith that are pleasing to you. Almighty God, merciful Father, we, we bow low before you during this pandemic. We confess that as a world, we have deserved your judgments and your discipline. And we also trust your promises that even when you discipline, your purposes are loving and good. So we ask that you please be present with your comfort among those most directly affected by this pandemic, especially those in India right now, and in our nation, and especially in Alberta. In your mercy, heal anyone who is sick, strengthen emergency workers, sustain those without work, and make shattered lives whole again. Use this tragedy to make us deeply aware of our total dependence on you, and give us the courage to face whatever the future holds, knowing that it and we are in your hands. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We continue with our last song. here. Now we have a worship Bible study and a Holy Communion next week, as is usual. And, um, ah, yes, two new things uh, for this week. So we have we actually have two, two Bible studies starting this week. So there will be a women's Bible study online on Tuesdays at 9 p.m. Uh, you can ask Anna about that. They meet on, I think they use Google Meet for their Bible studies. And uh, there will also be a new Bible study on the end times, what is going to happen at the end, and how do we know? That'll be on Wednesdays at 5, 
and that time at 5 o'clock can be a little bit flexible. If you if you were interested in that Bible study and you want to meet here at church, but the time doesn't quite work for you, um, and maybe even if you would be better for you if it, if it were another day of the week, uh, let me know, and we'll see what we can do with, with whoever wants to come to that Bible study. Thank you. And uh, we, we thank uh, everybody who cleaned yesterday. So it was, it was Daniel and Sarah as well who cleaned the church yesterday. And this next week's cleaners is the, the Bowl family. And I want to thank my wife, too, who uh, filled in for Laura today and played the final hymn. She practiced with, uh, with Millie in one arm and one hand all week. So yeah, very thankful for her, for her help. Uh, finally, here, before we get into uh, Bible study, something I want to point out that came up recently. So, the first reading today in church from Acts 4 uh, is such a, such a beautiful picture of, of the love that we have for one another. Uh, I'll, I'll just read a couple verses from that again for you. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. So it, it says God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. No one needed anything. They made sure everyone had what they needed. So um, just recently, uh, I've seen various people in our congregation uh, know about challenges other members are having, and, and they've been asking about how they can help them out. What, what a great thing to do. So. Um, if you if you know somebody in need, anybody, but especially in our church, then uh, see how you can help them. See how you can help them. If you want help with that, help with how to help them, you can talk to me and ask how some of these things work. You don't even need to go through me. You can just help them on your own. Um, but uh, also know, get to know each other, too. Uh, it's hard to help each other when we don't know what's going on in each other's lives. So if, if you have a need, speak up. Uh, if you notice something, uh, see if you can help. And uh, yeah, just, yeah, get to know each other. Let's be one in heart, of, heart and mind, um, loving branches of the vine. And uh, yeah, let's uh, do the, whoever has the clicker, could you bring that up please? We'll start our Bible study. Um, set my timer here for 19 minutes. And this is, uh, this is also a confirmation class for, for Daniel and for Kira, and I know there's some other confirmation students uh, watching online. Our Bible study today is going to, we're going to focus on baptism and how Jesus instituted it and the, the blessings that, that come out of that. Hold on here, I'm just going to set my timer to stay on task. So since we're talking about, uh, we're studying baptism today, baptism is, is one of the sacraments. And, and so the word sacrament is not in the Bible. It's a word that the church made up to describe something in the Bible. So uh, we need to first talk a little bit about um, what a sacrament means and some other definitions too. So a sacrament is, is one of the means of grace. So... Um, I'm going to let you figure, try to figure these out here. See if you can fill in the blanks for yourself. Uh, let's try, how about this side of the room here? Take the, take the means of grace. This side of the room, take the gospel. And I believe there's people in the other room. Did you take sacrament? Thank you, Tim. We'll give you about uh, 15, 20 seconds to look. See if you can fill in those blanks. start with the side of the room. We've got the, the means of grace. Can you fill in those blanks for us? How about our confirmation student? You want to start us off? The means of grace are the ways God gives us his what? What do you think? His love. 
Your first answer is correct. Yes. So a uh, grace, grace is God's undeserved love. So the means of grace is the ways God gives us his undeserved love. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and the means of grace are the gospel in God's word, word and Yeah, sacraments, yes. There are yeah, two sacraments, baptism and holy communion, yes. So, uh, and the gospel, the gospel, how about the, this side of the room, what is the gospel? Fill those blanks. Peter? Oh, here. Is the what? Yes, yes, the, the, yeah, the gospel is the good news that Jesus, uh, I think it says, saves, saves us from sin or, or forgives our sins, yes. Excellent, excellent answer, thank you for that. So really, you can see now that the connection between the means of grace and the gospel, so the, the means of grace is, is the gospel. The gospel is the good news about Jesus, that he saves us from sin, and the way that God gives us the gospel is through God's word in the Bible and through the sacraments. So what is a sacrament then? Uh, how about the other room? I think you got the, the microphone on. Number one would be a sacred act instituted by Christ. Mm -hmm. And number two is a physical element connected with God's word. Yeah. Number three offers the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Tim. Yeah, sacrament is a, a sacred act instituted by Jesus Christ for us to do. It uh, uses earthly elements, or, or uh, Tim said physical elements. Also, also correct. You know, earthly, a physical element, something that you can touch, see, or taste. Uh, and then it offers the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. So when we when we have uh, the Lord's Supper up here, that is a, that is a way that God is giving you His love, giving you His grace. Same thing with uh, with baptism, which we're talking about today. Uh, and before we move on and pass this slide here, so that the means of grace, God's is the gospel, the good news in God's word and in His sacraments. Um, that's what we're talking about today. So, so to remain with Christ. To remain in the vine is to make diligent use of God's word and his sacraments. So we, we don't want to be separated from God's word uh, or his sacraments for any significant period of time. If you separate a branch from the vine, it, it withers and dies. We, we need to be aware of this. We need to um, be around God's word often because that is our source of life. And without it, our faith uh, will die. Incredibly important here. So, okay, um, in the small catechism, which we're, we're taking our, our confirmation students through right now, uh, Luther lays it out very, very simply for us. He says, first, you know, what is baptism? He says, baptism is not just plain water, but it is water used by God's command and connected with God's word. It is a, a sacred act. Um, and which is that word of God? Where is that found? So Christ, our Lord, says in the last chapter of Matthew, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus commanded, we just heard these words, that we baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So I have one Bible passage below. So according to that Bible passage, what special comfort do we get by being baptized into the name of the triune God? Yeah, we're, we're adopted into God's family through baptism. Yeah, we're no longer foreigners um, or aliens in respect to God. We are his own family, protected in his household. Yeah, so adoption, 
Uh, your baptism is like God's adoption process where he brings us into his family. So here I got three Bible passages for us that refer to baptism, and I'd like us to find four blessings. What are four? You can, even if it's just four different words, even if they mean slightly the same thing, that's okay. But let's find four blessings of baptism here. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you read these for yourself and see if you can come up with four. See if we can make a list. means you have been forgiven. You got one. Come on, come on, Daniel. I know it might be difficult for you to see those passages. Saved from sin. Yeah, it says God saved us. Yeah. Excellent. So you got two. You were born again. Born again, yes. Yeah, from uh, the second passage from Titus. It is a washing of rebirth and where we are reborn because we're born in sin we are reborn through baptism into the family of God into the kingdom of God thank you for that I didn't believe that was Johnson it sounded like Johnson yeah there's three now one more four yeah renewal yeah it is it is how our spirits are renewed yeah and in fact even though we were baptized you know it yeah, we are baptized, and our baptism took place in the past. It, it continuously renews us. So we'll talk a little bit more about how that renewal happens next week when we finish our study of baptism. But yeah, we have we have four there. Yeah, you, you might also be able to add it, it is a it is a washing, something that cleanses us and makes us clean of sin. Thank you. Now, okay, so imagine. Somebody says to you, and many, I don't, I don't know about you, but many people have, have said this to me, that, that uh, they don't baptize babies. Um, now, if somebody said that to you, respond to them and, and defend the, the biblical practice of, of baptizing babies. I have three passages here for us that, that can help us. Um, there's the institution of baptism there, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. There is a, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And this last one, uh, from Luke 18, people were bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. How would you uh, defend it? You can take about 20 seconds here with your family or whoever's nearby. So how would you defend the practice of baptizing children and, and babies? I'll come back to the point. Or 30. Share. How do you defend this? They've the children uh, the born again, they expect the little ones to come in and it's not black. Yeah, well, so what, what's so black and white about it exactly? Uh, sinful from the time of mother and mm -hmm. So yeah, if we are if someone is sinful, then they need they need to be forgiven. And, and baptism is is it is it a means of grace, it is God's it's good news of God forgiving us, connected with something like water. Yeah. So yeah, we want to we want to bring sinful people to the solution for sin. 
which is Jesus' forgiveness. So bringing, bringing them to baptism, bringing babies to baptism is bringing them to Jesus. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, Jesus did not. Jesus didn't get uh, get specific, or he didn't. Also, he didn't exclude anybody from his his command to go baptize. He said, "Baptize all nations, all people." He didn't specify age or type. So we baptize all people. And I know we've probably already gotten into a little bit of the, the last passage, but yeah, but Joey, you want to talk about that one? Yeah, you don't have to under babies don't understand much, um, but yeah, God says they have the ability to trust. They have the ability to even yes believe because Jesus actually holds up babies, little children, as examples of faith. And you got, he says you gotta you gotta believe like little little kids to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, so yeah yeah we, yeah Jesus is uh, it's amazing. Yeah, the Holy Spirit can can work faith in even a, a baby's heart. And we believe that baptism is, is the way that he, he makes that happen. Or at least one of the ways. And here's our last, um, we discussed these here. We have about five minutes. Um, you can pick which one of these you, you'd like to think about or discuss. So um, what what a good godparent or sponsor would do. So not, and not, everybody, not everybody has a, a sponsor um, or a godparent. But if, if you do, or if you are a godparent, what, what are some good things a godparent does? Or what do they do? Um, the appropriate period to wait before baptizing a child or a baby. Uh, or number three, the, the administration of baptism by the pastor or by, by lay people. I'll let you, uh, you can pick which one you want to think about. I'll come back to it. These are, this is, uh, meant to, this is discussion, so if you can, um, I know you, we're all separated, and I know it's a little bit awkward to like try to discuss. I wish we were back in, uh, in the Bible study room, close to each other, so we could easily talk about these things uh, without masks and all that, but uh, we'll, do, we'll do what we can for now. So uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, but yeah, discuss those, please. Thank you for your discussion. Would anybody like to share a thought or or even a question they have about one of these one of these uh, discussion points? Joey? Uh, you have to 
baptized in the Holy Lord. Yeah, so Joey brings up a good a good discussion point. So um, he's thinking about the discussion point number three. So who can baptize? Could, should it only be the pastor or can it be other people? Now, when, when Jesus gave his, his command, his instruction to baptize all nations, he didn't say just pastors or just the leaders do it. He gave it to all disciples, this responsibility to all disciples. So any any Christian, that any person uh, doing it the way Jesus said can baptize somebody. Um, that being said, though, yeah, we can um, generally in a church for the sake of good order, the, the, the church asks the pastor to do most of the baptizing, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, especially in the case of in emergencies, if, a, if a, a young baby's in the hospital and, and the parents are worried about the baby and there's not enough time for the pastor to get there, maybe the baby has a half hour to live, if that's what the doctor is saying. Um, then, uh, yeah, any parent, the mother, the father, the uncle, anybody can baptize a child. That's how, in fact, that, that's how I was baptized. You know, I was baptized in the IC, in the NICU, in the ICU, in the hospital, because of yeah, there were complications. So my parent, my dad, just took a cup of water from the water fountain, the drinking fountain, and uh, just baptized me. So, so yeah, especially in emergencies, you don't have to wait for the pastor. Well, I'm just Yeah, why wait? Yeah, so if somebody, if it's an emergency, if somebody's dying, and they ask for it, any, anybody can baptize. Just do it, yeah, it's very simple. Just do what Jesus said. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And you get, if you've got some water, that's all you need. Those, the, the command and the instruction of God, the words of God, plus some water. And that's it. Really good to know if you're ever in one of those emergency situations. Now, we didn't even get to the other one, but uh, we're at time here. Um, I will just summarize, though. A good, yeah, things a good godparent could do is be a witness to the baptism. So that uh, when the, especially when a baby is, is grown up and they can ask, hey, who, who was there at my baptism? The godparents are, ah, I saw it. I saw you baptized. So you can give them assurance about it. Another thing a godparent could do is encourage uh, the, the Christian in, the, in their life of faith. You check up on them and you help with their spiritual training, you pray for them, other things like that. Now, if you don't, if you were baptized and you don't have a sponsor or a godparent, then, um, well, really, everybody who is a witness of the baptism is kind of like your godparent. So I know your little, little Sasha was baptized just a couple weeks ago. And uh, yeah, we, we, we were all witnesses of that. And it is our responsibility to make sure that Sasha grows up and, and remains a child of God and keeps her faith until Jesus takes her home. And uh, yeah, appropriate period to wait before baptizing a child? The Bible doesn't say. But we know that um, sin is serious and that makes it uh, baptism urgent, an urgent matter. We want to generally baptize a child as, as soon as we can. As soon as we can. <clears throat> but yeah, God does not call us to live in fear. So uh, we, we trust him. We trust him in everything. Well, thank you for your your, uh, your thoughts and your discussion here today. We'll close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we have been baptized into your family. We are your children. By your grace and power, we belong to you. Help us to live each day in the joy of our baptisms and to the glory of you, our Father. In Jesus' name. Thank you, and God bless the rest of your week.